I can really think of no better way to start things off and set the stage, as it were, for the presentations of our two speakers on this panel <clears throat> than by reading with you the passage from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where uh, it's recounted uh, God's calling of Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So from a life lived in a familiar land, amidst familiar society, you know, God speaks of your country and your kindred and your father's house. Abram is singled out and called forth to abandon his country and his, ho his father's house and to live in a new land. And in this new land, something unprecedented will occur. God will not simply establish for Abram a new kindred, a new set of relatives, that will replace those he left behind. No, instead, God will make of Abraham a great nation. What exactly is meant by a great nation? Well, for one thing, it seems scripture suggests that it is more than just a new group of kin because, as, he sa as it said at the end, all the families of the earth, all the groups of kin shall be blessed in and through Abram. So the calling of this man, this particular man, will result in a new kind of human community on the earth created through God's blessing. For Father Giussani, this call and this blessing is nothing short of revelatory of human identity as it's lived in the first person, both plural and singular. Who I am, who we are, is shown to us in this experience of Abram. <clears throat> Father Giussani comments, and you can find this remark uh, on page 22 of your booklet, uh, your New York Encounter Program booklet. He says, we cannot understand the I if we do not start from Abraham. God called Abraham. What does the story teach us? That the I is vocation, a choice as preference. So that from the day of that call onwards, the I is understood as an event within history, an event of dependence on God and of belonging to God. So the I is vocation, the entry of the person into history, uh, a universal blessing in an, in an individual call, uh, dependence and belonging as definitive of man's relation to God. The story of Abram, Abraham really thus promises to bring us, I think, directly to the most profound aspects of the theme for this year's New York encounter, from I to we, the time of the person, the origins of a people. So allow me then to introduce our distinguished speakers. So to my right here is uh, Father Richard Veris. He is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. He is currently the pastor of the Church of St. Rita in Staten Island and the chaplain for communion and liberation in the Archdiocese of New York. Father Veris contributes regularly to Magnificat magazine and is the author of two books, Jesus of Israel and Wisdom for Everyday Life from the Book of Revelation. And both of these are published by the St. Anthony Messenger Press. To my left, uh, we have David Flato, who is an associate professor of law, religion, and history at the Dickinson School of Law at Penn State University. He served as a visiting professor at the Hebrew University Law School and at Yeshiva University, and has been a visiting researcher at Yale Law School. He's experienced as an educator and lecturer and was honored in 2003 with a Teacher Recognition Award from the U.S. Department of Education. 
His research interests include legal history, constitutional law and theory, and a Jewish and comparative, uh, Jewish and comparative jurisprudence. His works have appeared in the Yale Journal of Law Humanities, the Yale Law Journal Pocket Part, the NYU Law Global Hauser Series, Diné Israel, the Journal of Hebraic Political Studies, Commentary, and Tradition. During the 2011-2012 academic year, Professor Felito was a visiting professor at the NY Law, NYU Law School Tikva Center. So I'm very happy to uh, welcome these uh, two distinguished speakers. And um, we're going to begin with, uh, begin with uh, Dr. Felito, and then we'll follow with uh, Father Veras. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here, and I very much appreciate the invitation and to participate in such a unique event. Uh, and I want to thank all the organizers and some dear friends who I uh, just ran into and colleagues um, from the past. Um, and it's a challenging topic to try to uh, make some headway in, in, in a short amount of time. Uh, but let me just begin on a personal note. If we talk about the I and the we, individuals and a larger setting, well, in some sense, my sitting here, I'm keenly aware of being an individual in a larger setting, um, coming from a different perspective so in a sense, there's a heightened individualism here, being a traditional Jew and an Orthodox Jew, but also grateful that there are larger communities of the faithful, of those who adhere to a moral calling, who sense a commonality and encourage um, those um, from other backgrounds to think in a more capacious sense of what bonds us and how in concert together we really have a lot of work to do to not just get hermetically sealed in our own individual circumstance, but to realize that if we open up and work in tandem, there are really so many bridges we can build together. So I wanna thank really the organizers for um, not just the invite, but for really the inspiration to think a little bit more largely. And I think in a sense that's a theme of my personal life um, probably born of this era um, in this great country in the 21st century where there's a lot of wonderful opportunities but also I would say concomitant challenges that go along with those opportunities. The opportunities are really to define yourself in a very individualistic way. We have choices, each one of us, on how we want to live. That was often not the case in the past, especially in the Jewish story. Jews often were minorities in larger host countries, and Jews were forced to live in a very um, sort of set lifestyle. And if those individual Jews want to break out, that was very, very risky. Um, and we don't know much of the individuals who even tried, um, because that wasn't really a choice. But today in the 21st century, in the United States, it really is a choice. How Jewish do I want to be? How important is my tradition to me? Am I Jewish or am I American? Am I Western? Am I liberal? Am I a believer? Am I a skeptic? Am I agnostic? Am I an atheist? All of these options are um, all too open in a sense. And that's daunting too. The great sociologist Peter Berger um, of course, captured this phenomena, uh, phenomenon in his book, The Heretical Imperative, um, a very worthwhile read if some out there haven't read it. By heretical imperative, he's returning to the Greek term um, for her heresis, which is to choose. So not a heresy of you know, going the wrong way, but actually an imperative, a duty to choose. Each one of us has a duty to choose because we live in a time where the choices are not so preset or predetermined. And sometimes we get lost in those choices and sometimes we live much richer lives because of those choices. That, from a sociological perspective, really captures, I think, 
what it's like to be religious and traditional in modern times in the West. And in a very personal sense, I've had both um, the, uh, the liberty and uh, the opportunity and also um, the challenge of making such choices. I'm part of a very traditional, orthodox Jewish community. I'm also part of a community of professionals, of lawyers. I'm also an academic. I'm also a real New Yorker and a uh, Westerner. I'm a lot of different things. And uh, I, I couldn't imagine really living differently because that's the blessing of the times I live in. At the same time, I know that it's difficult sometimes to retain a strong sense of core and purpose and essence when you're in so many different circles. And here, let me just turn briefly to Abraham, and then I want to um, deepen our understanding of Abraham through one crucial Jewish thinker who I'll get to in just a little bit. If you think about Abraham, first Abraham discovers himself by breaking from a community. This is alluded to in Genesis and amplified in early Jewish commentaries on, Exodus, on, on Genesis. Abraham's background is in Canaan. His father, Terach, who in Joshua we read about him as a quintessential idolater, a leading idolater. And the rabbis elaborate on his leading position. This is Abraham's father as an idolater in Canaan. When Abraham gets the charge and the call in Genesis 12 to leave the land of Canaan, he's told to leave his we, to leave his community. He will only discover himself through a great individualistic march, right, to a new land. I'm sorry, I keep on saying Canaan. I really mean uh, the countries of Mesopotamia, and he's told to march to Canaan. So in other words, he grew up in Mesopotamia and he's supposed to leave the idolatrous world and only by breaking with the we that he grew up with will he discover the I. And the thinker I want to introduce is Maimonides. Maimonides, perhaps the greatest Jewish philosopher, a medieval, powerful thinker, both philosopher and jurist, lives in the 12th century he lives in Spain, then he ends up traveling through Israel and gets to Egypt and very aware of surrounding cultures, both Islamic cultures and Christian cultures, and of course, so devoted to his Jewish tradition. So Maimonides, when he tells over the Abraham story, elaborates. He says, don't think Abraham was a kid when he left home. He actually lived a good chunk of his life in an idolatrous world. If you want to understand Abraham, Maimonides says, you need to know book one of his biography. Book one of his biography was Abraham was an idolater. He was an idolater for the first four decades of his life. And it was only through the courage to break from a we, to find an I who heeds a call from above, to have the courage to heed the calling, to have the inspiration, to march, to march to a new land that Abraham discovers the true path. So sometimes the individual has to break from the we when the we restricts the individual. But then part two of his biography, this is the way Maimonides fleshes out just in allusion to the Abrahamic biography. Part two is the story we know from Genesis. This is Abraham in a new land. And here the crucial point to appreciate about Abraham in the new land is even though he marches solo at first, he begins to build circles, communities. And there are various circles we could follow. In Genesis, he actually does not belong just to one circle. First circle we hear about is his household. His wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot. And that's important because some of his immediate household actually continue to challenge him. They aren't all part of his same vision, like his nephew 
And yet Abraham has great commitment to his household. So even though he's in a new land, he understands the circle of the nuclear family. That's one circle. Then there's the second circle. That's the main story of Genesis. Abraham and his offspring. In Hebrew, Zerah Avraham, the progeny, the seed, the followers, the faithful, those who understand the teaching of Abraham. That's a second circle. That's the one we usually pay the most attention to. And this is what all the great Abrahamic faiths focus on. What is it to follow the teaching of Abraham? But there's also a third circle, and this is important too. That's Abraham as the father of a multitude of nations, where Abraham is not just focused on his nuclear family, not just focused on those who follow his teaching, but the father of a multitude of nations whose blessing is projected onto a multitude of nations. Because Abraham, through his righteous path, knows that he can ennoble and elevate not just his nuclear household, not just those who follow the teaching, but actually a multitude of nations. Perhaps an entire world can ride on the shoulders of Abraham and Abraham's followers. So Abraham teaches us to think in various circles. There's an individual, and then there is a collective. And the collective cannot be defined in just one uniform manner. They're different concentric circles going outward. And we have to hold all of that together. I just want to go a drop deeper with Maimonides' teaching on Abraham, if you will. Again, Maimonides is the great 12th century philosopher and rabbi jurist. And it's so interesting how he devotes such attention to Abraham. And the reason I say it's interesting is because we know a lot of the great Jewish thinkers were very focused on Moses and the law. And so was Maimonides. And yet Maimonides, even in his retelling of the law, often alludes back to Abraham. And he says we always have to be mindful, even in our legal Jewish perspective of the teachings of Abraham. So what is the core of the identity of Abraham? And here there's an interesting duality in Maimonides' teaching about Abraham. On the one hand, he marks or accents, that Abraham is the great, and here this is interesting, I'm almost in the mood to quiz the audience, those who knows their Bible, and I'm sure some are out there who know it well. Abraham in Genesis, actually in the great story of the binding of Isaac, is declared as the one who fears or who has awe for God, right? That's the story in Genesis 22. But Maimonides, does not accent so much Abraham's fear or awe. Rather, he draws on a verse from Isaiah. In Isaiah, Abraham is singled out, not so much as the one who fears God, but rather the one who loves God. Zerah Abraham Ohavi. Ohavi, Ohave in Hebrew, to love. Abraham is the lover of God. And Maimonides stresses this at the end of his guide and also in a very crucial passage in his code of law. Maimonides says the highest form of service of God is to love God. And Maimonides tells us that's an aspiration. It's hard to get there. Very few have achieved this. And then Maimonides draws our attention to our great father Abraham. He loved God. That's what Isaiah taught us about Abraham. So what does it mean to love God? This is deep stuff for a Sunday afternoon, so we just want to touch on my mundane teaching of what it means to love God. So here is the duality I just want to allude to. In one place, Maimonides says, what it means to love God is for the individual soul, our innards, our spiritual nature, the individual spirituality, to yearn and cleave to God and God's way. Of course, that begins by our aspiring to connect to God, 
but of course is strengthened and emboldened by the reciprocal love of God for the individual. And here Maimonides goes into the great mysterious parable of the Song of Songs. Of course, he's not the first. We know in Christian tradition, from Origen to Clement to a lot of the great patristic writers talk about the Song of Songs as a parable of the love for God. And Maimonides also develops this theme, but I want to emphasize it's the love of the individual soul for God. That's one aspect of loving God. It's the individual quest. But elsewhere, Maimonides returns to the theme of loving God and Abraham as the lover of God. And let me just allude to one and maybe later I could allude to another passage. Maybe two passages and then I'll finish my words. One passage he says, Abraham had such great love for God that Abraham had to draw other people in. Maimonides says the following, if you truly love God, then you have to share that love because a profound love is bountiful. It spilleth over and it's intoxicating. And of course you have to share that love with others, with your kindred spirit. And again, I think it's broadly defined, beginning with the nuclear family, going to the community of the faithful, and then to the entire world to spread what it means to live that more rarefied and ennobled life a life charged with a mission of loving God. So loving God cannot be contained in the individual, but has to spill over to others. That's one teaching. And Maimonides again elaborates, this we learn from Abraham. And let me just turn to one other context, where Maimonides again refers to Abraham and says we learn a lot about loving God and the religious calling from Abraham. And he refers to the story, and this is in his code of law, it's so interesting, in a legal context, he refers to a Genesis story. And the Genesis story is that God, this is Genesis 18, and God appears to Abraham, and then three angels show up. And in the passage, suddenly we forget almost about God. And Abraham busies himself with the three angels or messengers. He bakes bread for them. He invites them into his tent. And Maimonides says, from here we see that as much as one is committed to the love of God, that can never be in tension with our relationships with others. Quite the contrary. If you truly love God, then you love God's creatures and creations and you realize that you have to give the same doting and loving attention to others that you would give to God. If you're so intoxicated with God that you forget about the visitor, you forget about those who need food and shelter, then there's a deficiency in your love of God. Love of God mandates turning to others. And then he adds one last point in the same passage. And this is an intriguing point. I'm not sure what to make of it, but let me tell you his point, and then I'll take a stab at it, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Maimonides says, well, how are you supposed to care for others? And again, one of the great, I think, contributions of Judaism is to really also break out and detail tasks. So Maimonides says you celebrate in the weddings of those who have a joyous occasion and you mourn with those who are suffering loss, and you give shelter to those who need a home, and you give food to the hungry, and you invite people in. And then Maimonides says, after giving us this beautiful laundry list of ways we can focus on others, Maimonides adds the following intriguing point. Maimonides says, if you invite a guest over, that's a wonderful deed. But even more important, Maimonides concludes, is escorting your guest when your guest departs. Maimonides says that's even more important than inviting the guest in, escorting the guest out. 
That to me is a really interesting, just small teaching. And I always was curious why that is. Inviting the guest in is obvious, but why is it so important to escort the guest out? I think perhaps what Maimonides is saying is that it's one thing to create our own sacred space. And again, to be open enough and have a capacious enough sense to invite others in. But in a sense, a higher mandate is to escort others out, to march along with others, to see where others are at, their lives, their challenges, not just to invite them into an intimate, holy, sacred space, but to take that sanctity and go outwards, march with others towards where they live in their existential realities, in their challenges, and to try to enter and bring some of the spirit and the moral calling in there too. So a lot of interesting ideas I hope that we can take away and think about and this is the balance, the individual soul, loving God, but also understanding that to live that out in a full spiritual sense, there has to be heightened awareness of our commitment and duty to others and various circles of the others that we have on our radar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flito. Uh, now we turn to Father Richard Veras. I trusted, as he did, that, that Dr. Flito would, would really enlighten us on Abraham, and so I didn't spend as much time on Abraham. I wanted to begin in, in Pope Francis' apostolic exhortation, the joy of the gospel. He has an entire section on the people of God. We evangelize as a people, and in that section, he says, what is the church? The church is a mystery rooted in the Trinity, which exists concretely in the history of a people. So its root is the Trinity and its expression is a people. And I don't wanna to get too heavily theological, but it's extremely important for us as, as Catholics, as Christians, because what does the Trinity tell us? God has never been alone, alone, has never existed. It simply has never existed. The foundation of all reality is a people. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a mysterious community of persons, each one uh, himself and this impossible unity, completely one. And so the root of everything is communion. And if we're created in God's image, it means alone, Completely alone is a lie. We tend to think of individual and then I'm gonna add on a community. But no, we're made for communion. To act as if we don't belong in a communion is, is, is to take on a lie. And so communion generates us existentially, profoundly, ontologically. Loneliness, we, we, it's a distortion. We become degenerated. This is expressed in, in human experience, any teacher, from kindergarten through 12th grade. If a student is extremely difficult in class, having problems, what is the first thing they think? Are there problems in the family? Are there problems in the place where this child belongs? Because a lack of belonging immediately expresses itself in, a, in an unrest, in a degeneration. What's the worst possible punishment for a prisoner? Solitary confinement. Because we're not made, we're not made to be alone. In Revelation, uh, again, God tells Abraham to leave his kinfolk not to be alone, but to be with him, to be with him. It's almost as if God is escorting Abraham, is or escorting Abraham out, marching with Abraham, uh, and promises, what does he promise Abraham? A nation, a people. Uh, and, and in early Christianity, the earliest fathers of the church in Genesis 18 have, uh, the early fathers have looked at those, those three angels as a, as a first manifestation of the Trinity. God appears to Abraham and he sees three angels, three, three visages of God. In Rublev's famous icon of, of the visitors of uh, the Trinity, the three of them around a table and there's an empty space because we are invited in, we are invited in. And so God invites Abraham and through Abraham he invites a, a chosen people, the people of Abraham. 
then as Christians we believe God in his mercy then becomes flesh in Jesus Christ to invite the rest of us, to invite, to invite all of us, to invite the, the fulfillment, to invite a, an entire nation. And so I want to look at Jesus. The first thing they noticed about Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, the first thing is that he spoke with authority. This one speaks with, with authority, an authority they'd never seen before. Why? Because for Jesus, he's not talking about God. As a, he knows God. He doesn't know about God. He knows God. God is Father. He experienced himself, as we heard yesterday with David Schindler, as the Son, the eternal Son, this, this eternal belonging. And so his confidence, his certainty was always his certainty and belonging. He was fully human, fully an I, generated by a we for, for, for forever, for since before uh, we or the earth existed. But so attractive, he was so attractive as a person. If you will, he was so attractive as an individual because he was always so, so aware of his belonging. Jesus doesn't do a single miracle, doesn't preach a single sermon, doesn't heal a single uh, blind person or lame person, doesn't do any of those things until the baptism by John the Baptist when the voice says, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. He does nothing until that's manifested and it's heard by others. So it's clear. It's clear what Jesus will say later. I only do what I see the Father doing. Everything good, all, all the, the, the love, the authority, all of Jesus' ability to embrace because I know I belong to the Father. I and the Father are one. And we see, what does Jesus do? He forms a people. Very shortly after the baptism, he forms a people. Uh, the apostles, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, a people is formed, even within the apostles, Peter, James, and John, who are clearly the three who are closest to him. And so the, the birth of a people. And then when people were taken by Christ, it was so interesting because as, as, in a similar to what we just heard, when I belong to Christ, I immediately see myself uh, belonging to those who belong to him. That dinner with the fishermen, and that when he calls Matthew, the fishermen and the tax collectors, this impossible unity. And the tax collectors, those who perhaps the fishermen had decided they don't belong. They've removed themselves from belonging. But Jesus goes up and calls the tax collectors, just as he called the fishermen. And there's this dinner. And that had to be a huge choice of the fishermen to remain. And they don't just remain, they don't just tolerate each other. As time goes by, they love each other. They're, they become one, they become one as a community. Jesus will pray for them. He will pray for them at the Last Supper. I have given them glory that you gave me, Father, so they may be one as we are one. That they may be one as we are one. The church, rooted in the Trinity, Pope Francis says, and expressed in the history of a people. In the same discourse, when Jesus prays that they may be one, he promises the Spirit the third person of the Trinity. How will you be made one? The Spirit will come. The apostles say, well, how can you leave us? How can you leave us? We, in, with you, Jesus, we discover who we are, never meant to be alone, meant to be looked at with your gaze. And Jesus promised, I am not leaving you. I will send the Spirit. St. Augustine says, who is the Spirit? He's the love between the Father and the Son. He's the togetherness, the unity, if you will. And then it continues on in Christian history, Christian tradition. St. Paul, who's persecuting Christians. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting, when he appears to Paul, why are you persecuting me, not them? I pray, Father, they, that they may be one as we are one. Why, Paul, are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir, singular? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, Paul had never met Jesus in the flesh like Peter, James, and John and the apostles did. And so Jesus, in speaking for the unity of Christians, the church, who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And how does Paul remain in, in relationship with Christ? Jesus says to him, go, go into Straight Street, be baptized by Ananias. You want to stay with me, Paul? You stay with me. You stay with the members of my body. You stay with the church. And we see Paul never went preaching alone. He always had a companion. 
Barnabas, Silas, Luke, Mark, the gospel writers were his companions at certain points. When Paul was in prison, he always asked for visitors. Paul's letters, at the end of his letters, there's greetings full, full, full of names, lists of names. Because Paul's the one who said, we are, we're the mystical body of Christ, this mysterious, this mysterious unity. There's a beautiful scene in, in Acts chapter 20 where Paul is leaving Ephesus and the presbyters of Ephesus are weeping. They're embracing him and weeping because Paul, you, you were a source of our unity. Why? Because Paul understood, I am not alone. I carry with me the companionship of God, the companionship of the church. And so Paul, as Jesus, Paul generates a people. As Christ belongs to the Father and is attractive, Paul was so aware of his belonging to Christ that he became completely attractive, completely attractive. He, well, I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to take too much time, but um, he says in one letter, he says, I know what you all say about me. His letters are great. When I show up, I don't look so impressive. He said, so pay attention to the letters. But the, but the presbyters of Ephesus paid attention to Paul and came to love him, to really, to really love him. And so Paul had a great awareness of his belonging. And perhaps with us in, a, in, a, in an individualist secular society, we're less aware of this, 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 certainly this ontological belonging, this belonging that goes to the root of reality our belonging to, to the God who made us, the God who makes us. It's interesting in, in the book of Deuteronomy, at one point when God is, is correcting his people, he says, since you have provoked me with a no God, I will provoke you with a no people. No God, no people. Because our belonging is deeper it's deeper than, than any sort of a superficial belonging is not enough to create a people. And our belongings tend to be superficial or conditional. You belong until, you belong until. But it's beautiful. Uh, in that visit is when uh, God uh, prophesies, one of the angels prophesies, the three visitors, that Sarah will have a child in a year. And she laughs. And one of the angels says, why did you laugh? And she says, I didn't laugh. And he says, yes, you did and off they go. And, and then it's, one, to me, one of the most important moments in salvation history. God kept Sarah in mind, and she had a son. So Sarah's belonging was deeper than her immorality, if you will. And Sarah said, I have reason to laugh now, and everyone will laugh with me, because who is this God? He's not He's not separate. He calls us. We belong. We belong. Sarah, Peter, who betrays Jesus three times, and Jesus says, do you love me? You still belong. The thief on the cross. Lord, remember me. Today, you are with me in paradise. You are with me. This belonging that's, that's deeper, that's deeper, than, uh, deeper even than sin. This belonging that's always renewable, it's objective. I could, I could disown my parents if I want, but I look like my dad, and I talk like him, and I have the fair skin of my mom. I can travel all over the world, and I'm still going to look like him. And so this belonging to, to the Trinity. And a couple of just pastoral examples, because certainly the more aware I am of this belonging, the more I'm built up as a person. The more I'm, I, I'm certain of myself, like Christ, the more I carry within me this communion. But this communion is even there. If there's lack of awareness, it's, it's less visible. But as a pastor, there's a day of the year that I find as fascinating as it can possibly be annoying, especially to priests. Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is amazing. Because on Ash Wednesday, every Catholic wants ashes. And so priests in our parishes, you're a marked man on Ash Wednesday. When I finish, I escape into the rectory. I don't go into the parking lot, because if I go from the parking lot to the office, someone's going to catch me. And St. Patrick's Cathedral, there's lines out the door. Forget, forget uh, a service of the word or mass. They just have priests and seminary. The seminary is empty. They send the seminarians out to help, because everybody shows up wanting ashes. I may not believe in the teachings of the church. I might not live according to the church. I might only enter the door of a church on Ash Wednesday. But I somehow there's a sense 
Not getting my ashes is somehow going over a line I don't want to go over. And not only am I going to church, I'm walking around the rest of the day with ashes on my forehead. I am announcing to the world, yes, that's me, that's me. And I don't know what level of awareness. Are they saying I'm a sinner? Are they saying I belong? But there's this sense in the people of God, there's a belonging. There's a belonging that, that I want to, on some level, assent to, and that I want to witness to. And so uh, Ash Wednesday is fascinating. Is it the ideal? No. I want to be more aware. And if we look at those who are more aware, my parish, St. Rita's on Staten Island, about a third of our parish are Indians from Kerala, India, who are, will sometimes, uh, some of them will call themselves Thomas Christians because they were evangelized by St. Thomas and they have an affection for St. Thomas. And so St. Thomas went to this, this place that must have been so strange to him. But I see today in my parish, every Sunday at daily mass, in our school, in our CCD program, I see the people that Thomas built. So when Thomas went, how aware Thomas must have been. I belong. I belong to that man. I doubt it. I refuse to believe my brother apostles when they say he was risen. I doubted him. I doubted him by doubting the church. I doubted him by doubting the apostles. And still I belong. And so uh, St. Thomas, as awareness of St. Thomas in the history of the church, the awareness of founders of religious orders, of lay movements, St. Francis, St. Ignatius, Mother Teresa, who I understand her first followers were her high school students. So attractive was this woman, Monsignor Giussani. These people who had such a sense of their belo of belonging and such a way of looking at others that told the others, you belong. And what so many of them have in common is they didn't plan to found anything. They lived their life, they joyfully lived their belonging and inadvertently, unknown to them, surprising to them, they were attractive to others. They didn't even realize that their being was an invitation, like that icon of the Trinity, that their being seemed to express to people, follow me, come with me, stay with me, and so we see how the awareness of this belonging can build us up. But no matter how much we're ignorant or lack the awareness, it can be taken up like that. We can be reminded of it like that. And so what did Father Jasani say about this, this belonging? He said it has two characteristics. He said, one, it's all embracing. The awareness of my belonging determines all the relationships, the way I look at everything in reality. And he said, second, it's Catholic, it's universal. It's a companionship open to all who encounter it, seeking to affirm the, the truth in everything, that we become protagonists, ready to, welcome, ready to welcome everything because every aspect of reality arises from him, arises from, from God. I wanna, I wanna begin my conclusion with a, a, a quote from Pope Francis, The Joy of the Gospel. He speaks about how Christianity uh, generates a people, the presence of God among us generates a people. Uh, generated, first of all, the chosen people, and then through Jesus Christ generates uh, the nations. Pope Francis writes, in these first two Christian millennia, countless peoples have received the grace of faith, brought it to flower in their daily lives and handed it on in the language of their own culture. The history of the church shows that Christianity does not have just one cultural expression, but rather it reflects the different faces of the cultures and peoples in which it is received. In the diversity of peoples who experience the gift of God, the church shows forth the beauty of her varied face. The church takes up the values of different cultures and becomes the bride bedecked with her jewels. That the variety of peoples and expressions of Christianity are the jewels bedecking the bride, the bride of God, the, 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 the church, the bride of Christ. I'm, I'm very, very blessed at St. Rita's because we have, when Christmas comes, we have our, our school celebration of Christmas, then we have the Indian celebration of Christmas, a mass and a party in the gym, then we have the Sri Lankan celebration, a mass and a party in the gym, then the Filipino celebration. Then we, we have very difficult, it's very difficult for us to find the days leading up to Christmas to get all the space we need for all the different uh, expressions of, 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 of the peoples. But a bride bedecked with her jewels, 
And what is the image Jesus gives of the church? We see it in Revelation as well. The church as the bride of Christ. Well, a man marries a woman. A human being marries a human being. You can only marry one who is like you, who is like you. And so we can only be the bride of Christ if we really, that it's possible that, that God becomes one with us. And the church, you know, we have the communion of saints and we're a communion of peoples. And, and so Christ generates a people. St. Thomas is one of the members of that people, but then Thomas goes as a, a fulfilled person who knows his belonging and generates a people in India. And so it's a person who generates peoples. From those peoples you get persons who then go and generate peoples and from there you'll get persons. Uh, this, this spilling over, this overflowing of God's love. All of reality is the overflowing of the love of the Trinity. And so you see how a history of the peoples uh, in its super abundance, its unimaginable uh, uh, non-ending of generation after generation and people and those who generate are generated by those that they generate. There's a beautiful story of a, a man from Africa who came to visit Father Jasani. And he said to Father Jasani, you are my father. And Father Jasani said to him, no, 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 you are my father. When I heard that story, it really bothered me. I thought, what does that mean? What does that mean? Jasani didn't just say things for, what does it mean? Because how generated must Jasani have been? I never met you before. You're generated by me? That means that within our faces, within our people, God is active. And so you, who are generated by me, are my father because I'm generated by what God is doing among, among the people of God. And so this, uh, this unimaginable unity that we yearn for, that's not fulfilled. Pope Francis uh, at some point says, we're not fulfilled, it's on a pilgrimage. We're on a pilgrimage. This is the ideal. And ultimately, heaven is a wedding feast. It's the wedding feast. But we know weddings don't come from nowhere. You don't walk into a church and marry a stranger. And so the fulfillment of this unity to be fulfilled unimaginably in the end, the courtship is now. We see a taste of this unity now. I see it in the peoples in my parish. I see it, I became a priest because of communion and liberation, the reality that generates the New York encounter. And so uh, the promise is, 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 is in the flesh now. The claim of the church, the unimaginable claim I am Jesus, I am Jesus among you. Father, may they be one as we, as we are one. Not may, may it be added on to what they already are, no. Father, may they become aware of who they are. May they become aware, may they become aware of this, of this profound ontological belonging that carries within it such a promise, such an, an expectation. Thank you. So I wanna <clears throat> follow these two presentations with uh, two questions and, and just see what our speakers might have to tell us further about this. Um, so first, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Felito. Um, you know, I was really struck by the way, uh, the way you, you, you characterize these concentric circles, um, the way in which uh, Abraham had, you know, for instance, these three uh, circles, and the way in which um, anyone who, who truly loves God is, uh, is always both in amongst um, the, those who are following Abraham and also uh, welcoming the other and even accompanying the other on the journey that the other is taking. Um, so there's, there's a view of universality here that uh, I think is, is really different um, perhaps from what we often hear because I think there's a, a tolerance or a looseness in a way, a multiplicity of belonging, a, um, a, a real uh, wonder in front of the journey someone is on um, that is at the heart of, of this perhaps. And so could you, could you tell us more about just 
maybe perhaps how you see uh, th this kind of universal, um, you know, call to a universal uh, human brotherhood, uh, how, it, how it relates to other views of universality that we have today, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, interesting uh, follow-up question. Um, I, I, I sort of feel for the need of candor to, you know, this is, is again, a, a tough challenge here to give a Jewish perspective on large questions. And obviously, there are a lot of different perspectives, even with uh, one of the great things about, uh, you know, Jew, Jewish perspective, it's never a perspective, it's perspectives, right? There are debates on everything. Um, and I think here, too, we could find such a range of viewpoints, those who are focused more um, on, on one of the circles, if you will, are those who are, are mindful that there are a variety of circles. Um, to me, that latter perspective is more uh, the perspective within Judaism that um, I feel uh, challenged by and inspired by, and that's what I think um, is very timely, um, uh, that perspective to share. Um, that we live in an era, I think, and we live in a time um, where we are greatly imperiled if we just focus inwardly. Um, I think there's a, a, a great um, chance that if we draw uh, boundaries and just look within, inside our um, most provincial community, um, that we will um, be marginalized in ways um, that are unfortunate and are not um, worth the price. And I don't think um, that needs to be the strategy. Um, and, I, and that's where I return to great teachings, teachings of Abraham, great teachings of Maimonides, um, of, of some of the great um, uh, models for us of the religious calling. Um, and, I, and I think the religious calling really um, invites us to think, both in terms of deep, profound commitment to our nuclear family, our faith community, the faithful more largely defined, those with a moral um, uh, set of values that we share, and humanity. And, and I really think that we constantly have to um, be involved at the same time in, in this challenging, coordinated participation in these varying communities. I'm tempted to cite more teachings from Maimonides on this. Let me just allude to one last teaching of his, which I think is relevant. It's really striking that Maimonides opens his code of law. And I would just want to emphasize, he really wrote two great, he wrote so much. He was a graphomaniac, okay? But he wrote two really um, eternal works that, uh, you know, 800 years later, we sit and pour over. One is his code of law. And that's really focused on the minutia of Jewish law. I'll get back to that in one second. And the other is his philosophical work, probably a little bit more um, uh, familiar to some here, the guide, of, the guide for the perplexed. I'm interestingly right now citing from his code of law, because his code of law is filled with details of how to observe the traditional Jewish Sabbath, right? And what happens if there's a tort in accident, you know, how do you compensate and how do you go to a ritual bath for purification, detailed laws. And yet in his code of law, it's really fascinating that the first four chapters, Maimonides speaks in such general terms about having a relationship with God, about appreciating the wonder of creation, about studying science and physics and then contemplating the profound ideas of metaphysics. And there's actually a word that's almost missing from the first four chapters. And that is that Maimonides hardly, at one point at the end of chapter four in passing, but basically hardly ever refers to Israel or the Jews because Maimonides deliberately is opening his code to humanity. 
All of humanity has a moral mission and has a duty to have a relationship with God. So he opens his code that way, the first four chapters, and the, and the, the way I know this is a correct inference is he also closes his code in a description of the messianic era and again in universal terms. So Maimani says, begin with a universal focus. And then only in chapter five does he talk about Israel and the normative duties of Israel. And here too, and this is the last of the teachings I'll just share. Here too he says, that the individual in Israel who's committed to the moral life, the spiritual life, the normative life, the life of great rigor and great duty and great commandments also always has to balance his or her individual responsibility with an awareness of the community, nay, the universal humanity they are a part of. So even when he introduces the normative charge to Israel, their duties, their commandments, immediately he corrects. And he says, don't get ensnared and entrapped in a too provincial a way. In other words, your calling is heightened responsibility. Your job is even more ambitious. You are a part of many circles. Don't neglect any one of them, but always be mindful of all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're, gonna, we're going to have to end it here. Um, but uh, I, we're going to have to end it here. But I'm, uh, I'm, I really do feel that we have gotten profoundly into the... Uh, the theme for the entire encounter right here with this panel. So let's give uh, final thanks to our two, two speakers.